Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Bio News and happy Friday. Today we'll begin with a, new, with a paper by Fang et al. about testosterone, a study in humans. In a double-blind placebo-controlled study, men who were given a single dose of testosterone had greater withdrawal of attention from repeated sensory events and orientation toward novel events. Basically, this means that they were less able to control their attention in the face of novel sensory events. This is as expected. A greater sympathetic, and this is my response by the way, what I note from my own notes, greater sympathetic nervous drive makes everything more salient. It turns on this, the, it, it seems to enhance the activity of the salience network in the brain. Um, I, I thought to use an example of how using uh, higher doses of am amphetamines, for example, will do the same thing to you. At lower doses, they'll help you pay attention. Your central executive control network will be capable of doing what it needs to do. In fact, it'll turn off sort of your default mode network. But at higher doses, it seems to turn on the salience network to where you're actually concentrated. You have your central executive control network in dominance, not your default mode network. But things in your environment will quickly d distract you. I believe this is from noradrenergic signaling. And I assume this is also what's happening in this study. Although they don't talk about any of this in the study. A paper by Zhang et al. on thawing and antioxidant status of plants. Now, this depends on the plant. This plant in particular was frozen baby mustard. This, this is, by the way, the kind of study that Greg Doucet should be reading instead of making so many videos. In this study, they took uh, frozen baby mustard and they thawed it either in the air or in water with bags or in water without bags or in the refrigerator or in a microwave. What they found was that the microwave was the fastest way to thaw the vegetable and also maintain the highest antioxidant capacity of the vegetable, of the thawed vegetable. In a paper by Niem Niemczyk et al, if there are any Polish people, please correct me on how to say his name. You'll find the citation in the about section of this video. I would love to know how to say this because I often see a C-Z-Y-K and I don't know how to pronounce it. I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. This paper is about the management of chronic kidney disease in terms of hemodialysis and filtration of the blood. Now, I mainly read this, read this paper in great detail because of my friend Boston Lloyd and because it's somewhat relevant to uh, many people uh, in our lifestyle and also men in general that may face kidney disease at some point. I'm not going to summarize the entire paper for you. I may discuss it at greater length in, a, in an episode with Boston. However, I want to mention some highlights. So this re paper reviews uh, how kid different kidney replacement methods, which means the kidney filters blood, so the, the replacement of the filtration of the kidney by hemodialysis or hemofiltration or so on, how they differentially affect oxidative status, status and health of CKD patients. Now, one thing to note is that only nighttime he hemodialysis can reach 50% clearance rates of a normal healthy kidney. The non-nightly kind of hemodialysis, which is what most people do, can only receive a, reach a maximum of 15% healthy kidney function. I didn't know much about this. By the way, this is a serious concern because there are three groups of, of toxins that accumulate in the blood. Uh, one, are called, uh, one are classified as small hydrophilic molecules like urea. Uh, there are protein-related toxins like endoxyl sulfate and p cresol sulfate. And then there are middle-sized molecules like uh, advanced glycation end products and things like that that also accumulate. These things cause a lot of damage to the chronic disease, kidney disease person as he or she is waiting for a replacement. Anyway, um, so now the interesting thing is that hemodia filtration is far more effective at cleaning the blood than the three or four times a week hemodialysis. Now it's more expensive, but it removes uremic toxins better and reduces ADMA, SDMA, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and interleukin-12 better than hemodialysis. By the way, guys, you should always test your asymmetric and symmetric di dimethylarginine, which is ADMA and SDMA on your blood tests if you're interested in your cardiovascular health, and particularly in your blood pressure and how your blood pressure may affect your cardiovascular health. It's something that I always have my clients check on a monthly basis or whenever they get their blood tests. Um, and uh, compared to hemodialysis, hemofiltration reduced mortality in chronic kidney disease. Um, now, next, a paper by Sudmand et al. Uh, about high in intensity exercise and sperm health. This uh, study found that while sedentary, low intensity exercise and moderate intensity exercise had similar effect on the expression of GLUT1, GLUT3, and MCT4 protein in the uh, gonads of, of rodents, High intensity exercise did not, and instead produced failed spermatogenesis in the rodents. This indicates that high intensity exercise may worsen sperm quality, 
potentially via it, me metabolic functions. You know, the GLUT1 and these things are involved in metabolism. Anyway, a next paper by Ma et al., or as we would say in Arabia, Muhammad et al. Um, this paper is about cigarettes, PCSK9, and uh, melatonin. So, uh, this in vitro study shows that cigarette smoke extract increases PCSK9 inhi uh, expression, which, by the way, as you guys know, there's a new class of cardiovascular medication drugs that inhibit the activity of the protein PCSK9. When you inhibit the activity of PCSK9, the LDL receptor upregulates in the liver. So, the problem here is that the smoke, cigarette smoke extract actually increases the activity of PCSK9 and reduces the expression of the LDL receptor in a time and concentration dependent manner. Meaning that PCSK9, meaning that smokers may be particularly um, a great uh, candidates for PCSK9 inhibiting drugs like Rapafa, which I hope to get prescribed soon. Pre-treatment with the antioxidant mel melatonin, which by the way I have a video on, you should check my channel, search melatonin. It's a potent antioxidant and nf kappa B activator. Anyway, pre-treatment with melatonin inhibited the effect the, of cigarette smoke on PCSK9 uh, expression. A paper by Joshi et al, or Zashi et al, sorry, is about Parkinson's disease and um, something called MTs. So this review paper concerns a new approach to targeting one of the two hallmarks of Parkinson's disease pathology. The two hallmarks are Lewy bodies and alpha synuclein. Uh, I don't know, ever, I never know how to pronounce this. It's alpha synuclein. Alpha, I've never heard anyone say it, so maybe one day I'll find out just the way Gorilla Chemist taught me how to say uh, racemic. Anyway, the point is that um, there are two main pathologies in Parkinson's disease. There's one called Lewy bodies, and there's one called alpha synuclein, synuclein containing neurites. Anyway, the alpha synuclein is this protein that is a pathogenic hallmark of Parkinson's disease, similar to how beta amyloid plaques exist in Alzheimer's disease. Now, this paper points out some interesting notes. So, astrocytes in the nervous system produce the antioxidant called metallothionine hyphen one backslash two, which is also called MT or MT hyphen one backslash two in response to oxidative stress to dopaminergic neurons. The problem is MTs, which is what these things are called, bind metals like zinc and copper and they're involved in metal homeostasis and detoxification in the brain. The problem is that some of the copper, uh, some of copper's roles are in aggregating alpha synuclein. So MTs can actually inhibit the capacity of copper um, uh, related proteins or enzymes from aggregating this alpha synuclein protein. I don't know really what this means, but it's an interesting insight. There's another paper by Maqbul et al, which in Arabic means someone who is accepted. This paper is about the ET1 receptor and diabetic um, erectile dysfunction. So listen to this. The history of the subject. In diabetic rodents, vascular endothelial growth factor, which we also call, the, call VEGF, which grows new blood vessels, is reduced in the penis. Sildenafil, which you may know, uh, know as uh, Viagra, sildenafil has been shown to regenerate the VEGF system and eventually rescue endothelial erectile function, endothelial meaning the blood vessels, of the diabetic rodent. Endothelins which are uh, like ET1, and endothelin receptor upregulation like ETA and ETB in the corpus cavernosum of the penis causes vasoconstriction and produces lesions similar to those of atherosclerotic plaques. Yeah, by the way, this is the, this is the one of the reasons you don't, as a man, you don't allow your penis to be dysfunctional for a very long time. You develop plaques in the blood vessel system of the penis. Um, I don't really know how these, I don't know much about these plaques, but I've come across them in several studies now that I've been studying uh, sexual function in the male. They're very frightening. And this is the problem with leaving the body in a state of dysfunction. Anyway, uh, so the vasoconstriction of ET1 is associated with rho kinase and enos dysfunction and so on. You guys can watch more of my videos on sexual health to understand what that is. Rho kinase is, anyway, that we won't get into it now. Anyway, in this study, they used streptozostosin. I don't know how to say it. It's called STZ. It's a chemotherapeutic drug. One major injection of this drug will turn a rodent diabetic. So they turn the rodents diabetic. They note that VEGF, endothelium nitric oxide synthase, and nitric oxide were decreased in the corpus cavernosum of the penis of these rodents within two to three weeks of developing diabetes with increased ET1 expression. That is the expression of the endothelins that are affecting rho kinase and harming uh, the vasodilation of the, of the penis. 
Now, what the study did was they used an antagonist of the ET receptors, specifically the selective ETA receptor blocker TA-0201 at one milligram a day per Sprague Dowley rat. By the way, there are various kinds of rodents. They all, their biology is all a little bit different, so it's important to know what kind of rodent your study you're looking at. Anyway, the addition of this selective uh, ETA receptor blocker, which is called TA0201, significantly reversed the down-regulated VEGF system of the rodents. By the way, I'm not sure that there are any human studies using AT ETA receptor blockers for erectile dysfunction. And this is a really exciting study and I'm going to be spending some time researching this endothelin system during the course of my study of sexual function in the coming weeks. Our eighth paper of the day is by La Fuente et al. This paper regards DHA, which remember in fish oil we have uh, EPA and DHA that are two molecules that are important. Now, generally EPA has been shown to be the most important for mental health. It seems to be because EPA is a potent neuromodulator that on its own in placebo controlled studies can induce antidepressant actions in people. But this study is about DHA, which most of the people think may have more benefits for our brains because DHA is a main building block in the brain. And the thought is that increasing the amount of DHA in the brain may improve brain function. But there haven't been that many studies that have shown uh, like phenotypic changes or behavioral changes because of DHA supplementation. Anyway, this study is specifically about retinopathy. Your retina in your eyes is made up of cells that are similar to the cells that are in your nervous system and in your brain. So this review paper summarizes the history of research that shows that DHA supplementation may improve the antioxidant defense system, protecting eye structures from oxidative stress-induced damage by upregulating the glutathione uh, by, by upregulating glutathione's activity. Glutathione is the liver's main antioxidant. DHA accounts for about 20% of retinal weight. It is the dominant fatty acid of retinal phospholipids. It improves lutein availability in age-related macular uh, degeneration. Lutein is one of the few, um, um, the few vitamins that's been shown to improve or to lessen or to attenuate the rate of degeneration and age-related macular degeneration, which is a common form of the way people just go blind when they get older, basically. Um, so anyway, this paper covers diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, and glaucoma. And it concludes with a recommendation of supplementing, a, I think, 1,050 or something like that, milligrams of DHEA in triglyceride form for people. Note that if you take it in triglyceride form, it'll be more bioavailable. What's nice about having things that are more bioavailable, they cause less stress on your kidney and your liver per the amount that they impact you. But if you're poor and maybe you don't take that many supplements and DHA is not that kidney or liver toxic, you probably want to just get the ethyl ester version and save some money and just double the dose. You'll still end up getting quite a bit of the DHE. In a paper by Aziz et al, and by the way, this is one of the ways supplement companies try to outdo each other is by having unique formulations, but it's not always the case that you need such a unique formulation. It's really the case when the thing that you're taking is particularly liver or kidney toxic. That's really when you want to look for like curcumin, for example, or something like that. Anyway, uh, a paper by Aziz et al, which uh, Aziz means elevated sort of, or uh, I don't know how to say it in Arabic, it's Aziz. Anyway, a paper by Aziz et al. Uh, this paper is about how blood pressure medications may imp improve what's called myelinization. I've mentioned in earlier BioBros episodes, as well as in my other episodes, that myelin is a lipid-rich uh, material that covers axons in our brains. Axons are sort of look, they look like sort of like te tentacles that project out of certain areas of our brain, sending neurotransmitters through the brain. As the, myel the myelin on these axons degenerates, the axons fun uh, func function worse, and there are specific diseases in which you have diseases of uh, myelin synthesis, like MS and ALS. Anyway, in this paper, they show that cuprazone, which is a copper chelating agent used to produce demyelinization in rodents. Anyway, th th this paper, basically, they used the cuprazone to produce demyelinization. I'm sorry guys, I can't pronounce this word. It's really difficult. Anyway, they, they, they produce demyelinization in rodents and then they give the rodents either telmisartan or the calcium channel blocker fidipine. Anyway, both of them attenuated oxidative stress and apoptosis due to having less myelin uh, because uh, by decreasing um, uh, oxidant uh, molecules like uh, malon 
aldehyde and caspase 3 and increase the avail increasing the availability of antioxidant molecules like glutathione and trophic molecules like brain derived neurotrophic factor they also reduced inflammation by uh, reducing the transcription of nf kappa b and increasing the transcription of nrf2 expression finally our last paper for today and for friday is by duan et al this paper is on the phytochemical genistine, which I take. Now, genistine is the most active molecule among soy isoflavones. It is a phytochemical that is a selective estrogen receptor mo modulator with activity particularly at the estrogen receptor beta, which is not the primary estrogen receptor. The, this review paper characterizes genistine's neuroprotective effects, and it does so in a variety of models. I'll just briefly go over them with you. The first one is, uh, patho is in basically Alzheimer's disease models, and it regards the pathologic beta amyloid accumulation. It's shown that genistein inhibits BACE1, uh, uh, which reduces the synthesis of, pa of pathologic beta amyloid. It inhibits the sim um, stimulatory effect of platelet-derived growth factor on beta amyloid synthesis. It inhibits the binding to beta amyloid fragments, preventing their aggregation. It attenuates the inhibition of kinesin AP1802T and uh, RH, uh, RAS homolog family member A, RHOA, uh, which both uh, increase the synthesis of beta amyloid plaque. So it reduces it by that too. It produces an anti inflammatory effect by, by blocking NF kappa B signaling in beta amyloid models, reducing the expression of interleukin 1 beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha. It blocks interferon regulatory IRF1 and STAT1 inflammation in a rodent model of LPS-induced toxicity, that's lipopolysaccharides. They're produced by the microbiome, part particularly in dysbiosis. In terms of cholinergic neurons, which are very important for memory as we age, um, in AD models, Alzheimer's disease models, it has been shown that genestine inhibits acetylcholinesterase activity, sort of similar to ginkgo biloba and some many other phytochemicals, and the drug that I take called donapazil, and reduces extracellular currents that cause the death of cholinergic neurons, probably due to excitotoxicity. It's also been shown to reduce the development of neurofibrillary tangles, tau neurofibrillary tangles, which are hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they decrease, specifically it decreases the hyperphosphor hyperphosphorylation of tau by regulating uh, CAM K4, CAM K2, and P Kreb levels. I only have two more things to go over with you guys. I'm sorry, uh, this was a bit exhausted, but I wanted you guys, for those that are interested in knowing how this works exactly, and so you don't have to re read the whole paper. It also affects apolipoprotein E receptor function in the brain. So in the brain, APOE is synthesized by astrocytes in the uh, nervous system that are activi activated by receptors, uh, the retinoid receptors RXR, and PPAR gamma, which is affected by telmisartan, for example. Um, so uh, PPAR gamma, which telmisartan activates, genistine upregulates, increasing the availability of APOE receptors, which consequently decreases the deposition of beta amyloid plaques because these receptors remove beta amyloids. My, and then it also affects mitochondrial function by eliminating free radicals and improving the activity of our natural antioxidant system. So, uh, by the way, I supplement with soy isoflavones, despite it being a phytoestrogen. And I suggest some many of you might want to also. I mean, this is, just shows you some of the effects of estrogen in the brain in general. And the reason why we don't want to inhibit estrogen too much, especially if we're using testosterone and things like that. Anyway, guys, I wish you a wonderful Friday.